Welcome to the heart of innovation. 60 minutes that could save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by Patient Advocacy Group, the Global PAD Association at padhelp.org in partnership with Reflow Medical, the pulse of medical ingenuity. Here are your hosts for the heart of innovation, Emmy award-winning journalist and founder of the Global PAD Association, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of Save My Piggies Health and Wellness, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Heart of Innovation. Today, we are shining a spotlight on a company that is truly making a difference in the world of peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is a disease more prevalent and deadlier than most cancers combined, defined by blocked arteries in mainly the legs, which cause leg pain, leg cramps, and neuropathy, which could lead to amputation if not caught and treated soonest. Now, surprisingly, we're not shining a light on this company for its products, although we will talk about them extensively today because doctors tell me one in particular has the potential to become a game changer for blocked arteries in both the legs as well as the heart. But we're actually highlighting this company today as the Global PAD Association's Corporate Champion of PAD Awareness Award winner through the PAD Impact Awards, because their commitment to patients goes well beyond products. They have a deep-rooted passion for patients with employees who are driven by personal stories connecting them to vascular and cardiovascular disease. They go the extra mile, pouring their heart into educating people about PAD and really making a difference in patients' lives. And it's evident by their social media presence, their participation in conferences across the globe, as well as through individual conversations I had during a recent visit to their headquarters in Southern California with many of their employees. And, you know, I remember when they joined our Light a Red Candle campaign this summer, it, it wasn't just about lighting candles. It was about lighting up awareness for PAD, reminding everyone that something as simple as walking can be powerful medicine for PAD. So I'm really excited for this conversation today where we introduce you to the co-founder and CEO of Reflow Medical, Issa Risk, and to explore a company culture that goes beyond just creating devices. He and his team are true corporate champions of PAD awareness and a little disclaimer here, this award nomination was actually made prior to their sponsorship of this show. It was decided upon more than three months ago, but it does further affirm why this company deserves the award. Always getting involved in initiatives to raise awareness for this disease that's so prevalent, yet 70% of Americans know nothing about it. So we're excited to introduce you to Reflow Medical and ESA Risk in just a moment. But first, a big hello to Dr. John Phillips, my amazing co-host, who has been off a couple of weeks saving piggies. Welcome back, John. We love you and we have missed you. Number one, uh, I'm glad to be back on the show. I missed a couple of weeks uh, and that felt like there was a part of me that was missing, although I know you did a great job. Uh, number two, we really miss you. I, Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we always miss you. It's I miss the banter and I, I miss the interaction with you, uh, the team and, and our guests. I'm, I've known Issa for a long time. Um, I think we've been pretty good partners together and I'm excited to not only um, chat with him, but also, uh, you know, recognize him and his company for what they've done uh, for those that have peripheral arterial disease, because it's more than just creating devices. I, I think industry has a responsibility to help, raise awareness for the device, you know, for the disease process that they're, they're trying to treat. Um, you know, ultimately we all get into the field of medicine because we're compassionate people. And I also believe that folks in the industry side of things get into it because they're compassionate as well. And they want to help people. And, and clearly, um, reflow ha has, has done that. And again, super excited that, uh, we're able to, you're able to give them this award and that, um, we can, we can chat with Issa, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, these guys never never quit um, innovating, which is which is pretty cool because 
um, you know, it takes it takes a while to get this stuff to market as we're going to as as we're going to hear. And, and, and it, I imagine there were times when you probably just want to throw the towel in, but you got to keep persevering and never give up on your dreams. And I want to bring him in. Let's bring in our corporate champion of PAD awareness, the leader, Isa Risk, the co-founder and CEO of Reflow Medical. Thank you so much. And, and a big congratulations to you. A very well-deserved award for you and your entire team. Wow. I Well, thank you. First of all, what, what an absolute honor and uh, very kind words from uh, the both of you. Um, this is exciting. We are uh, unexpected, honestly, and um, but we're, we're really excited about it and excited to keep this mission going. Um, I think what you guys are doing is fantastic. And, you know, the collaboration is, is, is even more important. So really excited to be here, excited to uh, talk through some of the some of the work we're doing at Reflow and, and in general, really uh, peripheral arterial disease and and uh, what we're all about. So thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate it. I'd love to go back all the way to the very beginning because <laughs> it's always curious to me. Pat is not sexy. It's just not. How in the world with everything that you could have been doing with your brilliant mind that you decided to go after peripheral artery disease? Now, don't take me wrong. We really <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> but... Why PAD? It's a great question. And, and I'll tell you, I wouldn't in a million years thought I would be doing what we're doing right now. I, I graduated mechanical engineering. I thought I'd be uh, designing uh, airplanes and uh, working in aeronautical, um, believe it or not. But we ended up, you know, I ended up at Baxter Healthcare. And from there, went to Edwards Life Sciences. And the main product line of Edwards Life Sciences is coronary, right, uh, valves and, and heart valves and coronary disease. And yet they had the vision, they would look at a, peripheral product line. At the time, it was a stent they were going to do in peripheral arterial disease. Um, it was called the Life Stent. We were a part of that team, original team that came up with this concept where peripheral arterial disease was known internally as the bastard stepchild. No one even paid attention to it. It wasn't the area of where interventional cardiology was headed at that point. It wasn't the area where cardiac thoracic surgeons were working. And so none of the above, you know, kind of uh, played out. And so for me, getting the experience to work on, and I, by that point in my life and my career, it was really about, you know, what are we trying to solve? What's the issue? And I didn't, I didn't at that point care if it was the heart, the leg, the, 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 uh, the, the head, it was more of understanding where the unmet need was. And ironically enough, there was a huge unmet need in peripheral arterial disease, but there wasn't a lot of focus. And, you know, so much of the, if you look at business in general and where the revenue stream was, it wasn't necessarily in peripheral arterial disease back in those days. So a lot of the uh, research and the work that was being done was in coronary artery disease. Um, and so for me, you know, again, it was more about, I could relate to this is, these are legs, they're being amputated, what, you know, they're not opening these arteries up. Why not? I mean, we're doing it in the heart. Why are we not doing it in the leg? And if you don't go in with a heart attack, it was, it was different. So a lot of, for, you know, my expertise and background came from designing products to work in the legs. So really taking away from the from the work that, that folks had been doing for many years in the, in the heart. Um, and that's what got us, you know, got kind of got got us excited about peripheral arterial disease. And I didn't care that, you know, we were we were second at the time or whatnot. I cared more about the products and the engineering working with these physicians that were at the forefront of some of this technology at that time. You know, getting through blocked arteries and legs was, again, wasn't sexy, but it was definitely needed. And um, I think that we found the tools that were being utilized weren't necessarily designed for that. They were being adopted to be used there. Um, I think mean, that's what kind of excited us. And from a patient perspective, you know, what's interesting is uh, no one really pays attention to your legs until you can't walk or until there's a pain or until there's an issue. But otherwise, nope. you know, you're always told, oh, just walk and exercise and you'll be just fine. Um, exactly. But when you're not, what happens? So that's, that's why we're excited about it. We think peripheral arterial disease, honestly, needs to be highlighted. What you guys are doing is fantastic. And, you know, hopefully what we're doing will, will, will help as well as we can move along. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to dive deeper into he and his team's passion to saving life and limbs. So don't go away right here on the Heart of Innovation. Let's say this patient that uh, I'm going to present is probably the one that was most eye-opening for me um, to believe what can be possible. Um, and, and I probably amazing. should let people know that if you are watching, that you may see some images that might be disturbing. So if you do have an uneasy stomach, just go ahead and, you know, keep your listening ears on. But 
turn away from the screen. Yeah, I can describe it too with words. So if you don't want to look at the screen, just keep the audio. <laughs> you could kind of imagine. But this is a, a man in his 60s with gangrene in one toe that had some infection around it. I took him to the operating room and amputated a couple of toes. The infection was spreading to the bottom. And the first step in limb salvage surgery is infection source control. So after I did this, I sent him over to my vascular colleagues who did an angioplasty. They found he had like one, maybe two vessel runoff. They did what they could. And then it was my turn to finish the job to close the defect. So we decided to amputate the rest of his toes to use the skin to cover the defect. And we got everything covered. Looks great. This is a few days post-op. Uh, he ended up necrosing the whole flap, meaning that the, the skin we used to close the amputation site did not heal. So the whole thing turned black. Now we got this large deficit that needed more surgery. So I removed the dead skin and put a wound vac to help suck at the wound to help it heal. And we got it healing pretty good. I eventually put a, a skin substitute to cover the little bit of exposed bone. He's got everything covered now where we could do a skin graft. So I did a skin graft. Um, here's a skin graft. And a few weeks later, everything completely infected again. We've got another severe gas gangrene infection to the skin graft and everything around it where the whole, a few more bones had to be removed and the whole front of his foot and leg is cut wide open where there's basically no flesh in the front of the ankle and the foot. At this point, I sent him to vascular surgery again. They did what they could, angioplasty, and they found one vessel runoff to the foot. And they told me that they think he's got a 50-50% chance to heal what we call a Chopard amputation. A Chopard amputation is traditionally described even in the orthopedic and podiatry literature as something that isn't really functional or viable because it's basically a leg bone, an ankle bone, and a heel bone. Uh, that kind of amputation is basically a peg leg, like a pirate leg. It's not really functional, but it can help you um, with transfer and very, uh, there's no propulsion, you know, it's just a peg. It's, it's basically a functional prosthesis is what we call it. So I gave the patient the options of going, you know, we could try this complicated show part thing, or we could cut your leg off and just be done with it. And he said, you know, let's just try. Like, I want to keep my leg. And, you know, he's still got some fight in him. And as long as the patient has some fight in them, I'll, I'll give it a go. So I decided to remove. Um, so this is a few days later. There's some more tissue that didn't quite heal. Uh, and I removed all the non-healthy stuff, infected stuff, and some of the bone. And this is, I mean... A normal show part amputation is where you have enough skin to cover everything. This is an open show part amputation where there's still bone cartilage and tendons exposed. So I, at this point in my career, I figured out how to cover, you know, get coverage over exposed bone, which isn't easy. But you have to delaminate the cartilage where I remove the exposed cartilage, use whatever healthy stuff I can to cover whatever bone I can. And the rest, we put a skin substitute to cover the exposed bone so that it can help heal over the bone. So this is a this is a cadaver skin that I use to cover the exposed bone of this open showport amputation. A few weeks later, it's starting to heal a little bit. Starting to heal a little bit more a few weeks later, starting to get some coverage over the bone. And eventually, you know, this is a few months later, we starting to, you know, get some good granulation coverage over the wound and the bone. And at this point, he finally healed after a year, a year of diligent wound care. And usually, show part amputations, people uh, don't think you could walk unless you have a brace. And that was my traditional training. And I prescribed this patient a brace to use, but he hated it. So he would rather just use his Jordans and just walk in that, his ankle, his uh, high top basketball shoes. Now here's a video of him walking with no brace, yeah, just his regular crazy. shoes. He's even showing off, taking off, <laughs> taking his cane off the ground. But this was like maybe three years ago, and he still sees me every once in a while for some calluses. But he's totally happy with this kind of amputation. 
that I never thought would be salvageable with a single vessel runoff and an open show pro amputation. Um, but this guy proved me wrong, and I'm glad that he wanted to try because I, you know, I, I learned how amazing the human body can heal things when the conditions are right. You know, it's interesting. A, a lot of these types of situations, it, it, it's a very strategic patient selection process because if you're going to put in all of the effort, the patient has to do the same. And so can you talk about that process by which you have that conversation with the patients as to what are you willing to do? Because, I mean, you would think that, you know, just cutting off the leg, well, you end up, you have a few months in a rehab facility, you get your, your prosthetic, you know, maybe six months, you know, down the road. And, you know, you don't have as much of a wound healing process, it, it would seem. They always say that AKAs, especially above the knee amputations, much easier healing process than even below the knee. And I would imagine even in this type of case where you just have one vessel runoff, you know, clear down there to the ankle. Um, it's, it's tough. Like, I, I can only paint the picture of the different pathways they can live their next year, whether they want to live it, you know, a few months in rehab without a leg and a prosthesis, but at least they don't have a wound, or they can go on for the next year seeing me every week for wound care, multiple surgeries along the way, with the possibility, because it, they have an open wound for at least six months, it's a complex wound too, that they could have wasted it all for nothing. Do six months of wound care, they still have a wound, it gets infected, we're cutting the leg off and at the end of all that work. It could be a complete waste of time, but they can then at least not have the regret of trying and fail than to not try at all. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Dr. John Phillips, spectacular, vascular moment of inspiration. Now, John, you had to have missed that the past couple of weeks. I do, you know, I, I missed the <laughs> intro, the music intro, that I missed that, and then I always miss the... <laughs> doo -doo -doo -doo. Like, that's always fun. But... um. In all seriousness, so the quote that I, I'm, I'm choosing today is from Eleanor Roosevelt. And I think that it epitomizes companies that have a dream, I think, because as I mentioned in the intro, a lot of times these these ideas, like they sound great. And personally, from a guy that's trying to develop a catheter, like in your head, this makes sense. But you have... It's hard to get other people to, to realize uh, and understand that it makes sense to, to them and that there's a business model behind it and like people are going to use it. And so this quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, she, she says, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams, because you have to believe in it and just keep pushing forward with it and, and never let let it die, which is what, you know, Issa and his team has done, whether it's their catheters, the wingman. I just, I actually, Issa was looking in my office. I have um, the little, everyone needs a wingman um, yeah. thing with from 2019. Like that was five years ago. It's like crazy how time flies. But anyway, just hats off to, to you guys for uh, believing in your dream. And, and again, can't wait to, to talk about Spur um later in the show but there's that's my quote i i love that and and it's all driven right by that deep down passion and, and that's why their team at reflow medical is so deserving of this corporate champion of pad awareness it's should be you know corporate champion of pad passion because it's really deep rooted and there's so much when i went down there to go visit their um, their headquarters down in Southern California, each person I talked to had a very personal connection to vascular and cardiovascular diseases. And I was asking a couple of the engineers, I said, I, you know, how is it? It takes so long to bring these things to market. And it's, it, the work is so intricate and, and very slow. And they said, it's just personal experience. It's, it's, it's family members, it's friends. Everyone is impacted by vascular and cardiovascular diseases. And I'm curious, Issa, um, you know, is this something that's, there's a question in your hiring process to make sure 
that you find these these individuals that truly have a personal connection? You know, uh, what's interesting, Kim, is I interview every single person that comes through because we do hire with passion. And, and I think the process that we run through is, you know, we really want them to understand. And I tell this to even all our employees, like, this could be any one of your family members. The work you're doing here at Reflow is mm -hmm. affects, and no matter what role you have within the company, everything you touch affects a potential patient, right? And, and I think that, you know, we don't, we like to build the passion and the culture so that it's not just a job. This isn't a, you know, a nine to five clock in clock out. There's a lot more to what's going on at Reflow. Um, so much so that we like to get folks, you know, involved in the, in the bigger picture and in, in, the, in, in doing the, the walks and understanding the need, the why, you know, why are you here? Why are you doing what you're doing today? Um, and you, you'd be amazed how much of it is really just, just conversations that we have, just, just the idea that, you know, as we're bringing employees on, having them understand the passion we have, I think it's infectious. If you can carry that throughout the culture and continue, no matter who you are within the company, you'll feel it. Um, that's a big portion of how, how we recruit. You know, we, we're really looking for the passionate people that want to make a change, that, that, that are working hard. And, you know, we do work hard, play hard, because I think it's a little bit of both. You have to understand that. But that's some of the biggest things that we do trying to bring in the top tier talent. And I tell people, you know, when we started the company, it was really small. We were we were considered a family. So we're not a family now. We are a team. And we're going to do that. We're going to get the A team. We want the best players. We want the best, most, mm -hmm. most passionate people. Because families sometimes, you know, you might not love them. And, and you can't you can't really do anything about that. And, and team and building the best team possible, you're recruiting the top tier talent that want to make a difference and that want to be there and that want to start and want to play. So I think that's really important in how we're developing our culture at Reflow. And, and I also think it's important to highlight out too, right? You guys were founded in 2010. Is that right? 11, 2011. 2011. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you're talking 13 years now. That's and, wow. and and I imagine there were times when y'all thought about throwing the towel in because because this, this space is tough to get into, right? I mean, like you're going after or you're trying to, to play in the sandbox with some big boys, yep. uh, the Boston Scientifics of the world, the Medtronics, et cetera. And so you're literally, you know, clawing your way kind of mm -hmm. up the mountain to, to try to just get a little bit of a foothold. So let me ask you this, Issa, was, what, what was, what was that like light bulb moment during this process where you said, okay, I think we've got something here. I think we can <laughs> hang with these, with the big boys. Um, and, and, uh, walk us through, through that, uh, experience if you might. Sure. Well, so I, I'll tell you, it is, it is very specific to build a business in medical devices is hard, really hard, really, really complex to put together a sales force to do all of the, so, so, you know, we came, our background is R and D. So R and D and creating and innovating as you're to your point, it's great to have a good idea. Uh, can you execute on that idea? And I think, for us, what we realized is we make some fantastic catheters. We are very proud of those catheters, whether it's the wingman, whether it's the specs, the LP. These are great catheters to get a, to get a procedure started. But we never had a therapy that would be the treatment modality. And I think as a company, as we develop, you know, we kept going back to physicians. We'd come up with one technology and they'd say, this is fantastic. I wish I could also have this or I could also have that. And being engineers, we went back and said, well, we can do that and we can do this. And we just kept progressively adding to our own bag. When we started the company, you know, I'll be honest, John, we thought we're just going to take our catheters and we're going to sell them to a Boston or to a, you name your big corporate strategic, and they're going to put it in their bag. Um, but what you realize is that doesn't always come with the passion that was around that technology either. And so it doesn't get you know, mainstay and it doesn't get to the doctor and the physician does not understand what the technology is because it doesn't necessarily have the highlight reel within a big bag. In 2015 is when we came out with the spur. And I think for us as a company, that was maybe our big aha that we could be our own company. We have our own bag. Let's go ahead and put that together. And so if you can imagine, we were working from 2011 all the way to 2015 on the catheters on and the, the, the interesting part about it is what we realized is we believed in everything we had. We believed our catheters were the best, but guess what it takes? A sales force, it takes marketing, it takes all of the other dynamics that really get you out to the market. And, and as you know, I mean, I spent many, many a times being our own sales force. You know, we had, we had an N of one coming to your lab or coming to anyone's lab. And it wasn't that the technologies weren't good. Technologies were great, but how do I get utility? How do I get it into the, into the, into the mainstream? 
Yeah, I mean, because speaking from just personally, we are I'm I'm blessed to have companies come to us and and want us to use their devices, and they're great. Like when you're in front of me. I love the thing and let's go. But like when you leave and then there's nobody behind you, that's right. I resort, we resort. I think, I don't think I'm unique. I mean, we resort back to, to the, you know, what we have and what we're used to. And that's why it's so difficult to do what you guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. And coming up right here on the heart of innovation, we're going to hear more of how they're doing it next right here on KDO. But you don't go away. I keep thinking there has to be some, some, you know, cocktail of drugs or something else that can stop the platelets or whatever it is, the plaque from building, you know, the blocks. I don't really know what to do other, but I'm, but I guess my question really is, should I just walk like 200 miles a month? I'm at a, I'm at, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to reblock in three months to six months. It'll reblock. So what do I do then? I'm not, I'm not really a fan of, bypasses unless unless there's a, a tremendous you know experience i want i want a proven technique a lot of what we do in this profession understanding that we can't just change your blood vessels because that's the cards you're dealt with uh is bring that inflammatory you know reaction to as low as possible uh, with some of the cholesterol lowering medications, with some of the medications that we put on our balloons and some of the stuff that gets sprayed uh, into the stents. But at the end of the day, at the game, at the end of the day, the long game is give you enough umph so that you can go and keep knocking those holes and walking because there is a chance and a pretty good chance that let's say after a few times that you do that procedure and you're going through these ups and downs of, of oxygen necessity, that through walking, you are expanding the amount of what we call vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. And VEGF is a very potent signal in your arteries to build new arteries. And so what'll happen, hopefully, I hope for you that this will happen, is that you have been significantly improving your collateral pathway. And that what'll happen one of these days is that that stent may occlude and you may not even feel it. And that <laughs> the reality is that that day, even in the, I, and I can tell you, I've got patients that run marathons that have got occluded stents. I don't necessarily just chase it because at that point, your body has created enough passages around the blockage and a natural bypass made by your own cells that we don't need to chase that stent indefinitely till death. So keep in mind that I think if you're exercising routinely and you're feeling that with each one of these occlusions, less is happening, there may come a, a point where you may want to have a conversation with your doctor and say, is there any need at this point, doc? Because I actually just played 18 holes and that stent's 95%. Do I really need it open or do I have enough collateral? So I think that's something at least to look forward. Welcome back to the heart of innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. I, and I know Kim is, we are both having a blast here talking to Issa Risk, the um, CEO of Reflow Medical. And guys, before we went to break, we were, and during break, we were talking about the whole catheter development process that you guys were doing. And then you kind of pivoted to what I think is kind of a revolutionary concept and device. And for me, as a physician, getting new catheters, we, we talk about creating a better mouse trap, so to speak. But that, uh, again, doesn't necessarily move the needle for us. We, I like to look for something that's kind of groundbreaking. And what you guys did with the spur starting back in 2015 to trying to get this sucker commercialized now in 2024 is, is a pretty amazing thing. And, and can you just go through that, um, the evolution of that device with us? And if I'm wrong about the whole mousetrap thing, push back on me, please. But I, I think you would agree, right? Like if you come up with something that's revolutionary as opposed to evolutionary, that's better, right? Uh 
hundred percent. And and I mean, I always tell people we did the company backwards. Most people start with the revolutionary and then have to fill it in with a bunch of the catheters that are required to do the procedure. Um, we did it backwards in that we started with the catheters that again were were nice and evolutionary and I think state of the art. But the reality and the highlight reel to get in the hospitals and to get into the centers to get to the physicians, you need something revolutionary. Um, and then hence the spur. And for us, I think the spur was really about we finally made our, our transition into the therapeutic side of business into, into the highlight and people thought we we're crazy. And, and, you know, and I think you've seen it. It's a, you know, having spiked stent that you're going to put into the yeah, artery. So just explain to our audience like <laughs> what, what this, you know, people think of spurs as the thing, you know, on the boots, but that's clearly not this. So what, what is this device? <laughs> what are you talking about here? <laughs> so, you know, so imagine a woman's hairbrush that has like uh, the spikes on it when they're brushing their hair. That was the actual original concept of the spur. It was, it's, it's a stent. And on the on the ends of the stent, there are these uh, spikes that come radially around the whole the whole uh, diameter of the spike of the stent. There's about 96 of them, um, and this stent is self expanding. So when you when you open it up inside the artery, it comes up to the diameter, and then you can resheathe, which means you can you can bring it back down by applying a, a, a force using a catheter, and then brings it back down. And so it's temporary. The, the whole idea was that we're going to go into the artery. We're going to open up the artery using the stent with the spikes digging into the arterial wall where the disease is and hoping to fracture and open that artery up um, and, and, and make sure that the calcium or whatever disease is there, the fibrotic disease is, is broken up. You then create channels also for drug delivery. You then resheathe the system and remove it. And uh, while, you're, while the stent is up, you have arterial flow. So really... <laughs> Interesting no, concept, and, right? And, and the other thing that's kind of crazy too is you somehow got the FDA to buy into a retrievable stent. Like, so in my experience, and for our listeners, a stent is a permanent device. People ask me, like, hey, are you taking this thing out? No, nope, we put this in. You're you're going to meet St. Peter with this sucker. But mm -hmm. you guys have this as retrievable, that's which right. is I, I want I, well. Maybe we don't have time to go into that, but I'm curious as to how you got that that uh, through the well, FDA because that's kind of we we really questioned the concept of why are stents in in the first place. If you go back and, and I mean you know this more than anyone, why did stents even why did they why would they evolve? It was really to help solve an acute issue. It was that you were opening an artery, but then the artery wasn't staying at the same time that you were in the procedure, um, or you were dissecting the artery, or you were seeing what would they call recall, where the artery comes back down. And so then we put stents in, but then no one ever addressed, well, how long do they have to be in? And for many years now, if you think about it, all we've been doing is making them, trying to make them biodegradable, put drugs on them. So they just, you know, they disappear um, and, and, or remove them. And so I think for us, understanding that initial concept of why stents were there is let's get the best result we possibly can for the patient and outcome at the procedure. And that should help us get better long-term results at the same time. That's what we've been researching. And I think that was the concept of, well, do I need a stent in there and for how long? And as you know, in our current procedure, it's up to six minutes and then everything is removed with a pristine look. And I, I thought that Dr. John brought up a really good point just about just the name of the stent because stent is synonymous now for the most part with something that is left in. Was there any thought in your mind at any point to call it something else, like call it in general, maybe just a scaffolding versus using the word stent? So what's interesting is now, as we look at it, we're, we're calling the therapy, retrievable scaffolding therapy, right? So retrievable scaffold therapy, RST. And we're driving from that, the idea of the spur stent itself, because the interesting, you know, in, in talking to the FDA, even in, in doing this, it is a, a stent. If I were to give you the technology in your hands and you look at it today, it's a stent. It's uh, just as a nitinol stent is with the difference of not being implanted. But everything else that goes into making and developing and designing this is the same work that stents do. Now, the scaffold concept has come up because of uh, our work in Europe that we're doing as well. So this is a global product now. And there are terms that we're now you know, working on relative to calling it retrievable scaffold therapy globally. You have a spur stent in the U.S. And then you have the spur scaffold in, uh, in Europe. So there it's, is, it's a it, nuance it's, on, on, on it's, words. <laughs> it's interesting, too, because I was reporting some cases for for abbott and they're a spree stent which uh -huh. is bioabsorbable and they actually had me edit they have to edit it and add me call it a scaffold like they do not want it to be a stent so i get that like this is yeah this is where things are moving to 
um, mm. something that is either bioabsorbable or not not permanent. So, I, I we like the scaffold concept as I look at it like painting. When you're painting, you put scaffold up. When it's done, you remove it. And you know we look at it as the artery you're painting. You know you're literally trying to get the most pr pristine flow characteristics, and you know getting nice um, no dissections, no recoil, whatever it may be. So you're scaffolding it. And then as you're done, you're removing this thing. And I think it's it's yeah. kind of interesting how how that marketing has come together. I mean, for us, we're we're you know we're working on this concept where we've got this. I think one of the biggest advantages we've got is the fact that you can keep this up and have arterial flow. You know, you can see the work that you're doing. Technically, have the artery flowing while this te the technology is in the body still and doing exactly as we've we've assumed. And then you bring it back down and still see that result. And if you want to bring it back up, you have the option up to four times to do it again. And so I think it's it, it'll be interesting um, as we get out to the market. And I would love for Dr. John actually to explain the, the benefit of that, because that's something that seems like it would be hugely beneficial, especially in the heart. It can make all the difference in the world. Yeah. I mean, I think the <clears throat> the heart, the heart, is, I'm curious to see like what your all thoughts are in the coronary space, because I mean, we've we've pretty much cornered the coronary market in the sense that you got a blockage, you get a, a third, fourth generation stent. They last for 10, 12 years. Some, I mean, like it's ridiculous. And we can't, that doesn't translate to the legs. And yeah. so the, the, we have not cornered the market on what to do with the legs, particularly below the knee. And this is, again, what makes their device interesting because they can come into, at least in my opinion, come into a health system that, hey, this is kind of revolutionary. And we don't have to play the game with our back committee that says, well, what are you going to play? You know, what's going to go away if you bring this in? But because there's really nothing like it. Right. And so you guys know that. Um, and plus you're, there's the billing game too. I mean, I'm assuming you're going to be able to bill for a stent, yep. which is advantageous. Cause again, let's healthcare is the number one business in the, the world. If not, I know in the U S if not the world. So, I mean, this is a business and so they were very smart in, at least in my opinion, in positioning their this device as a stent that is retrievable or scaffold that's retrievable to get the billing for the stent, but actually you're not putting one in, if that makes yeah. sense. So it was pretty, very clever, very clever. <clears throat> well, and, and we, as you know, John, I mean, we, we experienced in healthcare from the day I first started to where we are today in that unmet need is, is first and foremost. Clinical efficacy. Are you running the studies? Are you doing the work? Are you trying to understand what this technology is doing? And then clinical reimbursement. And so if you don't have all three of those, it's really tough to bring anything to the market and to, to the customers uh, and to the patients. I mean, it, that, sometimes some of the best technologies don't win because there isn't reimbursement or there isn't a path. And that's sad, but it's true. I mean, it's the reality of healthcare. And it's it, to your point, it's not just in the US, it's global. You know, we, we face the same things in Germany and Europe um, and all the CE mark countries today. Um, and that's something that we're really, really, uh, you know, uh, full steam ahead on and working. And even from the first day that we worked on this technology, that was one of the, the, the pieces of the puzzle that we had wanted to uncover. And so the how nice do you balance? Is... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say the nice thing about the device, too, is that it it offers treatment in the arteries that are very difficult to treat below the knee. Uh, we've got the new tech, newer technologies out there now, a spree, clearly, and that's bioabsorbable. Um, but you're not going to put seven of sprees in a leg and right. artery. And so like, I always struggle with where am I going to put this thing? And yes, it works. It works very well. I mean, it's basic. We knew, we know stents work well and it, it call, and focal lesions in the tibial stents work well, but uh, you can't put 10 of these in. And so this is an exciting technology too, yeah. but the proof's in the pudding, and then obviously now you, you get some drug on it, and then we see where we're at. And that's right. It's uh, yeah. it's, and, it's a fun and, time and, to be part of Reflow, I imagine, right? <laughs> it, it is. There's a lot going on, and you know. And I was gonna I was gonna answer your coronary question in that you know our focus in the coronaries today is instant restenosis. So to your point, I think we're going to go with the low hanging fruit. The fact that we don't want to see layers and layers of stents going in when there is an occlusion. It's a smaller piece of the of the broader market, but it's a big unmet need. And I think Agent Balloon is the most recent with Boston Scientific that's been approved there. But we think there's a lot of room to deliver the right drug at the right location, getting in through fibrotic lesions. Um, and that's what we've been researching. Well, coming up right here on The Heart of Innovation, we have more with Reflow Medical's co-founder and CEO, Issa Risk. So stay with us and don't go away. 
your type of condition is called critical limb ischemia. It's the most advanced form of PAD or peripheral arterial disease. Every four minutes, there is an amputation in this country due to PAD and diabetes. We also know that 85% of these amputations are preventable with early intervention. It's a flip of the coin. Patient prognosis is tied to whether or not they are referred to a true expert in the management of peripheral arterial disease. Do you know if your physician is an experienced CLI operator? When you're in the hospital dealing with doctors and stuff, you know, you figure they know what they're talking about. The skill level varies doctor from doctor and hospital to hospital. Patients with limb threat are in constant fear. The depression that someone experiences after they lose a limb is equivalent to those of losing their spouse of 40 years. I was stuck in a wheelchair close to two years and my husband had to quit work. I didn't know what to do at this point because we had had nothing but infections and hospital stays and infections and hospital stays. And they took one toe, another toe, and then it was another toe, and then half his foot before he was even diagnosed with PAD. And all I heard was, what are we doing here? Just cut it off. And I pulled the curtain back like, oh, are you kidding me? Do you really want to go through all that? That's crazy, that's insane. The protocol is to send them to amputation. Always, always, always get multiple opinions. We do have options. We need to listen more to our patients. If you're going to chop off their leg anyway, why not just let someone else try? This is the progression. First comes the wounds, and then comes an amputation. And I wasn't gonna accept that. So that's what it's like to try to save a leg. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So, Issa, we were kind of talking about um, a treatment or, or why the spur, why you guys came up with the spur, and and you, and you mentioned kind of low hanging fruit. So, talk us through why you chose. So, the spur right now is for below the knee arteries. So, these are smaller arteries, um, you know, oftentimes two and a half millimeters in diameter, but long, you know, upwards of 30, 32 centimeters in length. So, the most complex ones that we treat, it. I don't know that that's low hanging fruit as opposed to maybe something above the knee, bigger diameter. That's where the more durable devices exist. The stents that, that you know, the drug coated stents, drug coated balloons, they work pretty well up there. So I guess at, walk me through that process of where you said, yeah, I guess we're going to go after the, the <laughs> below the knee as above, as opposed to above the knee. And, and, yeah. what, and did you have like coronary, a coronary application in mind at the same time so you can do the two together? Yeah, funny enough, John, we, we yeah, we chose below the knee because everybody else failed and we love the challenge. And and I think that it was about and now if I were a finance guy purely, they would have said, hell no, we're not going to give you a penny to go below the knee. Everyone's failed. And and I think that's what gets me excited. I wanna where people have failed, I wanna I wanna go and try to help, right? And so I think we chose below the knee, uh specifically trying to understand why people failed what we think was what we at that time perceived, you know, people were trying drug eluting balloons. Well, drug wasn't getting into the arterial wall. That was known. There's a lot of calcium there. The disease is long and diffuse. Um, these patients, um, as you know, these are small arteries. So you don't want to leave anything behind if you don't have to. Um, stents failed, uh, you know, um, um, so there wasn't really a lot of any technology that we saw. And hence the idea, if you think through the spikes were to try to deliver drugs into the wall, the stent was to give the opposition so you can open the artery and the removal so that you don't leave any liability relative to the artery itself and not block anything off long term. I think those were why we chose below the knee. It would have been easier to go to your point higher, uh, you know, go to the mainstream, but we're not mainstream. You know, we, we wanted to go where, you know, I think, like, like I said, where I think we see the future of, of innovation having to be. And that's in, in the, in, in the um, below the knee space. What's interesting is it does lend itself to doing coronary work as well. And so the arteries being very similar in size, the tortuosity that you're trying to get to. Um, and so at the same time that we were evolving, you know, developing the spur for the for the below the knee space, we uncovered the unmet need in instant restenosis for coronary disease. 
And so there, there's where we saw the synergies between the two. Um, and, and as you know, we started the spur with a bare version of the spur, not drug on it yet, and now, are now evolving to add drug onto that, that, that system, really trying to answer our own research. Do you need drug, number one? How much drug do you need? And when do you need drug for the patient um, relative to below the knee space? With the biggest thing, I think the challenge that yourself and other of our advisors have in the past have told us is don't go after short focal lesions. That's something I can treat and, and or can treat. Go after the long diffuse disease. This is the actual patient population that we see on a regular. And, you know, in our studies that we've developed for the spur, we're very open. You know, it's up to 220 millimeters of lesions. Um, you can use the spur up to four times. Um, so really try to address it. Is it the most, you know, again, if you were very financially driven, you'd want to have them use, you know, oh, I want you using six spurs. But the reality is th there's a fine balance between the, the finance part of this and the actual healthcare economic side where you're really just trying to make a benefit to the patient too. And so you want to get a technology that has versatility. Um, so I think we're able to leverage that a bit. So we're excited about the potential. Do you think this is going to make a difference in those doctors that you see who are outspoken that claim that you can't treat below the knee at all? Have you talked to any of those doctors that are heck bent on saying, nope, not possible. If they have vessels that are blocked below the knee, walk, walk, walk until you can't walk anymore. And we're just going to cut it off. Yeah. So let me tell you, um, we're really excited about that part of this business. I think that it's going to open up. I think if you look at what's available for treatment today, it is a little bit, you know, using standard balloon angioplasty um, works, but but you see a lot of repeat customers. And I think that some of that is is also the reason that people don't want to even try. And, and I think that if you can show them better uh, results, if you can show them that there's an advantage into using a new technology, um, I think they'll, they'll be open to trying it. And that's what we're, you know, that's, our mission and, and our message out to the to the folks that aren't going below the knee. And as you know, I mean, I think for us, even if you looked at the complete patient, but there is a the percentage of patients that we're treating are the ones that really can't go out walking. They can't really go out and just you know uh, you know uh, exercise because because their their, their um, anatomy doesn't allow them to right now. And you know maybe they they could have 10, 15 years prior, but a lot of times when they get to our technologies and what we're doing. It's 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 time to intervene. And, and um, are you running into positions that just don't acknowledge below the knee? Yeah, we are. You know, you, you you'd be surprised. And you know, I mean, I, I I don't have to tell you who they are. I think you could figure out what their what their practice looks like. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with uh, historically the evolution of this technology of, of peripheral arterial disease. As you know, it started at you know iliac SFA, popliteal, and then they stopped. <laughs> you're like, why are you stopping? But because by the way, it's also harder, right? As you know, getting through and knowing do you have the right tools and equipment to actually get through this blocked artery that's below the knee. And do you want to take the time to learn if you're not? I mean, we're, we, and I'll talk about it in the session, but we, we are, we are, we are investing big in education and training. And that's not just for, for our people. It's for the global masses. I mean, we're, we're really trying to get out there um, because I think one, one of the things I've learned in, in being in the labs not every lab is the same. And, you know, and I've sat through people that also tell me they do below the knee and then I go and see it. <laughs> and, and, and I've had the luxury of being in labs like with, with you, yeah. right. Where I know this is real. This is like legitimate treatment. And then there's others where you're like, wow, they need, they need a little lesson. They need, they need help. And how can we help as a company? No, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'll also just say that like you, you guys are, as it stands right now, for the most part, a below the knee ish company. And then this device is below the knee. And so people that are intervening on the vessels below the knee, those interventionalists are treating people who have chronic limb threatening ischemia. That's right. About 7 million people worldwide of the 230 or so million that have PAD. So it's a small fraction, but I think it gives you guys an opportunity. We've talked about this offline to be a chronic limb threatening ischemia company and right. to train people to train your staff, not only for the spur, but just also to help docs, to Kim's point, treat these people because this is an unmet need. And I do believe that industry has some fiduciary responsibility, and I think you do as well, which is why you're on our show and which is why you have the award and which is why you're sponsoring what Kim does to, to kind of help raise awareness to this disease that is not sexy. We don't have a spokesperson for it. 
And these are, or it's an orphan disease, basically it still is. And, and I, I truly appreciate what, what you guys have done. And I feel like y'all have the mentality of, Hey, we, we want to actually raise awareness. We want to, this is our, this is our microphone and our podcast that we can talk to people about and, and raise awareness and help prevent the amputations that, that are, that are happening in my opinion, um, needlessly for, for some patients. Um, I think the bigger thing for us is we're, we're all in, we're all in on CLTI. We're all in on education. We're all in on training. We're, we're taking it to the next level over the guards to not only in our own corporate offices, getting people involved in part walk, in walks and getting them involved in our own passion projects, but also getting out to the masses relative to the physicians. We, you know, you're going to find us, we're going to start a, a, a huge initiative on education and training. And it's, it's not educating and training relative to just our technologies. It's actually the therapy and the treatment modality and what is being done for CLTI patients. Um, I think we have, we have, we have a mission here and, and we're excited about it. And getting that word out means investing, investing our time, investing our, 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 our money and our energy around this concept of why are patients not being treated today? How can we get them treated and how can we get them treated with long, uh, uh, long term results? I think that, you know, we are we're excited to do this. Um, I think that, you know, I sat for a long time on the American Heart Association's board and realized that all the work that's being done in the coronary world can be done in, in, in the peripheral world and particularly in CLTI. And when you look at complex PCI and complex disease, this is it, it, there's a synonymous uh, um, uh, energy here with complex CLTI. And teaching people how to treat CLTI and, and getting that word out is going to be our mission moving forward. And I think we're, you know, we're, we're primed to do it. We, you know, again, not only just on a device side, but just on the message of, you know, getting opinions, getting patients to the right physicians. And then the physicians that really want to learn and want to be educated, want to get to that next level in their arterial disease for peripheral arterial disease we're hopefully going to be the ones to help them get there. And, and I think we're excited to be spending a lot there. I would, I would just say like, you guys have a great opportunity to do that. And, and if you're successful, um, you, you are going to open the a door for, for physicians that didn't know it existed, honestly, because I think there's an opportunity to create, to create training courses. And really, I mean, we, there are, there are algorithms for coronary CTOs. Like there is an algorithm that you follow. We've, talked about doing this for critical limb, but really haven't gotten there. But partnering with you guys at Reflow, I think can, can get us over that mountain. So I'm hoping to be a part of that. Oh, you will be, baby. We're excited. <laughs> <laughs> so what still keeps you awake at night when you think about the future of PAD treatment and awareness? Uh, to get the word out. Get the word out. I think that the, the, the lack of f folks knowing about it is really what hurts us. And, 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 and taking it seriously. I think that's really, and that's our goal. We're going to help do that. What, uh, what's the best piece of advice you've gotten from somebody along this journey? Um, don't, don't, don't ever stop. Keep the passion going. And I mean, passion drives us all. And I think that we've been fortunate. Um, I'm a very passionate guy. So here we go. <laughs> And um, we do have um, just a few questions, I think from a couple of patients that are, have joined in our live studio audience today. Um, I want to get to, I, okay, Douglas, Douglas, go ahead. First of all, I want to say, as a PAD patient from the bottom of my heart, I cannot begin to thank you for what you do for supporting this program and the ability that we have every Saturday to learn from Kim and Dr. Phillip and all the doctors that join us. So from all the PAD patients, thank you for the support that you've given us. It, it is it, it is a blessing, and we appreciate it. So, mm -hmm. my question about the pro the stint is, what are, like the long term effects of not having that of having that removed compared to leaving a stint in? What about like scar buildup? What about like reoccluding? Is this product going to help that in the future? Yes, that is that is the goal. So, what we're studying now just to, um, is. Upon removal, we uh, look at the artery, obviously, uh, when we do the initial, uh, some of the initial work that we did in research is to see how the artery heals over the period of time. And then longer term, what the occlusion rates look like. So how often is a patient coming back in or not coming back in? And is that artery open or closed? So a lot of the research that we have done 
all the way from Europe and, and now here in the U.S. has shown re really remarkable data. In Europe, I, uh, some of the data we've shown and we'll be presenting here at the end of this year in some of the bigger conferences, um, really unseen before, where you're in the north of 80 percentile of not, not seeing an occlusion um, and or coming back in. So excited about the potential of this technology and the fact that we're uncovering the idea that you don't need to leave something in and still get sustainable results. Um, that's what we're really excited about, Doug. And Kim, Kim, go ahead and ask your question. I was just wondering, have you had any success in marketing with it, this in Canada? Not yet. Uh, so, so right now, um, we don't. We we got approval in 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 Europe. Um, we've submitted for approval here in the U.S. Um, we anticipate and hope that this happens next year, early next year, um, which then would allow us to to go into the Canadian market as well. So we're 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 getting closer. <laughs> And I'm just curious, um, because I didn't get a chance to ask you this one. I, I wanted to see if you could describe a moment when you realized the true impact of your work on a patient's life. Is there a, a specific case? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'll tell you, a lot of our first in human clinical work we did was in the Dominican Republic. Um, and, this, and, and, and what's interesting about the work we did there is um, just based on the, the, the setup and structure, we got to see the patients uh, and their family members outside waiting on what's going to happen. And we were able to treat these patients. And then progressively, we got to see the patients from day one when we treated them all the way out to one year. So I spent about three years, my, myself and my team, about three years of our lives in the Dominican Republic every other week, um, treating and looking and, and, and getting, to put the, getting to put the physician hat on, which we weren't physicians, obviously, we were just sitting in the rooms in the back, but really seeing the reaction and response from the patients. And more interestingly, the ones that would come in and they'd be, they'd be limping in, but they'd be walking out, you know, and it was really an, an incredible to see the wounds heal. And I never really even got, you know, having not had a wound myself, but seeing a wound heal over time is probably one of the most rewarding things you can see yeah. from a from a, a, a patient's perspective. And the fact that they can now walk, they can put on their shoes. They, it was just a, and we got to see it. We did 23 patients in the Dominican Republic. We had really incredible results there. And that's what drove us to take this project, obviously, and start moving it along in the US and Europe and whatnot. Um, so I, I would say on that one, Kim, there was probably a good, so out of the 23 patients, 50% of them had very bad wounds that ended up healing over the period of time that we treated them, which was really incredible. Any other questions from the audience? Douglas has another. Dr. Phillips, is, is, is what you go through, this product that he's talking about, can you see it making that big a difference in below the knee with what we as patients go through in the long-term survival rate of keeping our leg? Yeah, so um, there, there's, a, there's an interesting new book out that um, I – I'm starting to read and it's called um, uh, Blind Spots. And it's it's about, or it's written by a, a surgeon. And I will answer your question here, but stay with me. So it's written by a surgeon from Johns Hopkins, Marty McRae, I think it is, M-A-K-A-R-Y. But so it just goes through the whole notion of what, like we get things wrong a lot in the medical profession. And we th what, what we think we know is right, probably doesn't have a lot of um, data behind it and it may actually not be the right thing. And so like the peanut allergy, for example, or breast cancer with estrogen that we got those wrong, but people believe them to be right. And my point here is we don't treat below the knee blockages unless you have an ulcer or have rest pain. And the reason we don't do that right now is because we don't get very durable results. But I also believe that patients who have these blockages clearly have symptoms and the symptoms aren't always rest pain or an ulcer. And so when there is a technology out there that potentially can get us to think differently about this disease process and also get a, give us durable, long lasting results, because the problem with it right now is you have an ulcer, you've got a blockage below the knee. I open it up. Maybe I put a stent or two in. It will close at some point. I guarantee you that. And it's fine. If, it, if you heal the wound and your rest pain goes away and you develop more collaterals, we leave it alone. But will there be a day because of technologies such as what ESA has that where we actually treat these patients who have 
just pain when they walk, the claudication that occurs. And and that that's my hope. And that's why I think that this device can help help get us there. Um, and I mean, Issa knows the hurdles that that they've already kind of cleared and the other hurdles that they have, because you've got physicians who for right or wrong, and I hey, we all live in glass houses, so I don't I don't throw stones, but for right or wrong, don't believe in treating below the knee. Um, and you have physicians who just aren't they're not as they don't have enough experience with it. So they quit easy, you know, very quickly. And so again, this company has an opportunity to not only change the landscape, in my opinion, to not only change the landscape of the treatment, but also the education of physicians, patients, because you will always hear Kim and I say this on the show. Every time you guys have to be your biggest advocate, you have to rally for yourself because at the end of the day, we don't, you know, we kind of fail you. The the book that I reference, Blind Spots, forty two to forty three percent of Americans distrust the medical system right now, and that's not good. And so we've got to educate more, and we have to be um, better stewards, and we have to be more humble as physicians in treating patients. Long, long winded answer, Douglas. I'm sorry, but another my soapbox. I'm off it now. No, I think he he is showing it. I think he appreciates that. You know, and I, and then that's what I love about this show. And this is why, um, and I don't know if you some minds if, if I bring this up or if you guys, well, you don't know what I'm going to bring up. So I'm going to bring it up and you can shut me up if it is inappropriate. <laughs> but we were with this show, Dr. Phillips and I have literally dedicated, um, we don't get paid for this. We dedicate every single Saturday to trying to provide education you know, for, for patients, not only in the San Francisco Bay area, between 18,000 and 20,000 individuals in the San Francisco Bay area alone, every single week live. Those are the, those are real listening hours. And then we, we stream it online and reach so many others across the globe. And we did this for, for two years. And we submitted a couple grants this summer and it was so disconcerting to see companies come back literally so quickly to say, we don't have enough money and we have other priorities. And for me, I, I kept it kind of quiet and, and Dr. Phillips, the kind soul he is, you know, was like, you know what, if I have to help just pay for it, I, I just let me know how much, let's just put it in. I'm putting it in. You know, we really got us through this summer. And I finally was like, this show is really going to go away because we can't just afford to do this on our own. And I put it out there on social media, you know, and and just risked, you know, being embarrassed that we couldn't get a sponsor, ah, you know. Um, and Issa and his team literally rallied. And I get this call, I think on, was it sa even Saturday morning? And they were like, I don't care. You just tell us how to make it happen. We're making it happen. You know, no need to jump through hoops, nothing else. We love what you're doing and we want to be a part of this. And it really meant the world to us. And as you can see by Douglas and those patients who show up every single weekend to get the education they need so that we can help build back the trust in the healthcare system by empowering the patients with the real cutting edge information and the right questions to ask their doctors to make their 15 minute consults more informed and productive. I mean, it, it's priceless and it really means the world to me. Honest to God. Well, and, and Kim, you said that, you know, I, we dedicate our Saturdays. Let's be honest. You dedicate the week. I dedicate a couple hours on Saturday and it, I know it drives you crazy sometimes when I don't respond to you, but I mean, like you push the boulder up the hill three quarters you know, two thirds, I helped the other third, maybe, but we were going to, uh, th that was the thing, you know, it, it kind of dawned on me like, well, I, I guess the show, I mean, we can, we can cobble enough money together to get it running, but like, what's the point? Like if we can't get, in my opinion, if we can't get our, in, my colleagues in industry to kind of help us, then we failed the message. I mean, we failed. Um, and certainly Issa and his team, they rallied. They, I think, understand what we're trying to do here. And this is, this is just the beginning. I believe that, you know, there are conferences out there, but the the it's a grassroots effort, I think, to change this, the, the outcomes of this, this, this disease and, it, and it's going to have to happen 
through patient advocacy and, and, and we just need more and more momentum. And, and I, I, I'm very thankful for Issa and his team to kind of help, uh, that they're helping us out, um, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. Issa Risk, he is the co-founder and CEO of Reflow Medical, sponsor of our show, and the recipient of the 2024 Corporate Champion of PAD Awareness. Congratulations to you and your team, and thank you for all you do to save life and limb. Thank you all. Thank you, Issa. Thank you. How many, how many procedures are you willing to go through? Is it worth going through that many, or would you rather just... <laughs> I was planning... <laughs> Was it worth it? Oh yeah, I have my leg, man. Amputation should absolutely, positively, 100% never be a first line treatment. What an incredible operation, what an incredible lab you have here. Without a doubt, we're underdiagnosing peripheral arterial disease. It has not gotten the attention that it should because it is a killing disease, it is a disabling disease, and most importantly, it's a disease that we now have great treatments for. Okay, let's go to the next one. They were going to amputate it, didn't I? I needed to consult with my family. Did I want it off here or here? You're just shocked. You just, I mean, it's scary. I mean, I don't even know how to explain it. You're 42 years old. We're waiting till people are at the end of the spectrum and almost beyond hope. There is good care available here. Close minds for what we have to get rid of.